Hey y'all, this is Chris Hicks and welcome to the Southern Rock Insider. If you like what you see, please hit subscribe and click the notification bell. It's time to rock Southern style. The Southern Rock Insider. Well, the first time I ever heard the Outlaws would have been on the radio. And uh, there goes another love song. I like that song. And after I heard it two or three times, I guess the DJ said it was the Outlaws and knew it was them. And that's, that was my introduction to the band right there. I did. I had the uh, first album. It had Green Grass and High Tides on it. And Hurry Sunday. Oh, I'm sorry, not Hurry Sunday, but uh, There Goes Another Love Song. And uh, several other great songs. But that's the only album that I ever had at that time was the first one. And uh, so a lot of this, when I joined the band, a lot of the songs they were playing by that time, some of them were brand new to me. And, uh, but you know, that's rock and roll. And, uh, <laughs> and I learned, learned them and they became etched in my mind after playing them 200 dates a year for six or seven, eight years, however long it was. And uh, it was a real treat. When I first started getting involved with the Outlaws, we, uh, Loose Change, opened a few shows for them. Plus their, their uh, warehouse was down here at Allen's Building. So they would come and go from here. A lot of times we would see them if we'd be rehearsing in, in the rehearsal room there. So uh, Huey and you know, different guys would come through. Alan had introduced us. So uh, he came to listen to a couple of songs when we were rehearsing. Alan sent us both to Muscle Shoals for separate projects a few times where uh, he would have the studio during the day or have it at night or vice versa. And that became uh, us playing on each other's stuff. You know, you know how that works out. <laughs> you play, everybody kind of plays on everything. And we started cutting tracks when I say together, I played on his stuff and he played on mine, you know, and uh, we had a good time doing that. And uh, so he'd been through quite a few guitar players, I guess, through the years. And uh, and uh, Billy Yates was playing guitar with the band. And, and I went and saw his first show at the old post office emporium over there. And I thought he sounded great. Uh, about another year goes around and uh, I'd seen him a few times, I guess. And uh, he says, hey, man, we'll, we'll put the band together. Come join as a third guitarist. And let's, Let's get together and get a record deal, you know, do it again. And uh, I said, okay, you know, that sounds good. So that's what we did. We, uh, they added me on and uh, became four people out front again. And I, I don't know, it kind of caught a little of enthusiasm maybe from its old days, but we had a really good band, B.B. Borden on drums and uh, Jeff Howell on bass. Ian Evans was on bass some of that, those years too. Rob Carroll also. And, um, but yeah, we played a lot, 200 dates at least every year. And, uh, a lot of rehearsing and stuff for new songs because we did three albums during that span too and uh i don't know where we found the time but we did <laughs> first gig with the outlaws was uh i uh, can't remember exactly where it was at but somewhere like uh up in maine or somewhere somewhere way up north and uh you know the first run that i did with them didn't realize that abbott worked for the band abbott was a great guy that everybody knows from around here and from macon and <laughs> we're, we're me and huey's house down in tampa and we're going to drive up to maine and here comes abbott driving up the equipment truck hey man wow so for the first year, couple of years i guess uh, i had a good buddy on the road that didn't realize it and uh, he, he was a abbott was a great guy he sure was and, you know he told me uh after that first year he said my i've got a daughter so i'm gonna come off the road i'm gonna raise her and that's what he did and i'd see him through the years whiskey river or whatnot and one day, many years later, I've been with Tucker for a long time by this point, our road manager says, uh, keep an eye out for guitar techs down there. You know, we need to get somebody. The next day, I run into Abbott. He goes, you know what? My daughter's raised. I'm ready to go back on the road. I said, you know what? And I uh, give him Debbie's number, and he'd come out and uh, back on the road. Bam, just like that. Lots of good road stories with the Outlaws. Um, of course, you know, a lot of people, uh, Outlaws Motorcycle Gang, Outlaws Band, two different things, you know, Outlaws. But we did play for the Outlaws Club quite a bit. We played for the Hills Angels, too. And uh, we played for anybody that paid us, you know. And most of the time, both of those biker organizations paid us great, and everything was straight up, you know. They may seem like a loose bunch of people, but they know how to take care of business. They really do. And, uh, but there was one night we were playing in the Outlaws and the Hills Angels, and the Pagans were all there. And... Uh, so they've got the place surrounded kind of, and it's like we're not gonna do the show. There was one cop, I'll never forget, he's there. And so they have a summit meeting on our bus. Presidents and a couple of guys with each one, they take, start taking their guns out and they fill the whole bunk area up with guns. And they figure it out. They said, well, the pagans are gonna stay outside and breathe the perimeter. The outlaws are gonna go in and listen to the band. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the, the outlaws are gonna stay out and beat the perimeter. The Hells Angels are gonna go in and hear the band. And that's how it, and everything worked fine, and there wasn't one bit of trouble. When when he's walking to the stage, the policeman said, "I'd love to be a fly on the wall in there," <laughs> but it was like I say, very professional. It was really uh, the guys out, outside the perimeter holding these big sticks, you know. And there's a big circle around it, so you know you get a little uneasy that something's going on. But 
But man, when those guys talking to each other, it, it was like uh, the politicians should be. They actually worked out the deal pretty quickly. And not, a, not a bad word was spoken, and thank God, you know. <laughs> we're in, uh, up in Connecticut, and we have a night off, and Charlie Daniels is playing that night, where we're playing the next night. So um, the crew were all invited to go to the show. And, and uh, he, it's funny, Huey had got mad at the crew when we got checked in the hotel. They made him unload the truck and load it back up, you know, for practice, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> And uh, there was a tool convention in the hotel. I don't remember that. I'll never forget that, too. I didn't go to the show. So I stay in my room the whole time. The crew, co Our crew comes back. Okay, where's the truck? Where's the big joke? You know, where, where? Anyhow, they had somebody had stolen our truck, the entire truck, and it was gone. So we call the police, and they come there, and hours go by, and, you know, our road manager, well, they don't really do anything about it. Anyhow, we, we uh, rented everything, guitars and all that, for two more nights. And then we went home to regroup. And... Uh, our management company ended up buying us, you know, new equipment and stuff like that. It was a, it was a real um, bummer. But some of the Hell's Angels guys that we knew and partied with, we we asked them, you know, if they maybe could help us out with it, and they did, and they found it, and and uh, we bought it back for five thousand dollars, and that was a truckload full of stuff. I mean, it was five thousand dollars of drums alone. I had two Les Pauls in there, so anyhow, it took about a year, and uh, they found it, and uh, they said drive on up. Two guys rented a van, went up, and, and got all our stuff back. And uh, happy ending to that story too, man. I couldn't thank them enough. Uh, we couldn't get anybody else to be serious about, you know, the police report and all that day. Nobody really seemed to give a shit. But those guys, yeah, sure, we'll help you out. We'll see what we can do. Yeah, so I joined the band, <clears throat> the Outlaws that is, and almost immediately uh, we started doing a few of my songs just because Huey liked the songs. You know, we, we put them right in the set um, in, in a blues song called that ended up being called the hitman blues i would sing different words to it different nights and all but uh superficial love which was a loose chain song we ended up doing uh putting those on records later on but we pretty much put a couple of three in the set immediately and uh um, so it comes we're looking for a record deal basically and uh, mike varney who had itch no no mike varney had uh shrapnel records and uh he approached us with a deal and uh it, we were a little shady about it at first because he wanted us to come out to California and rehearse and work really hard, <laughs> to be honest with you. But it was good for us. We did. We, we, we did what a band's supposed to do. We went out there for three or four weeks and set up in a room and worked through arrangements. And he, Mike would come in, and, and he's a real good guitar player and actually a, a pretty good producer. And he, he would say, well, this is this, and he would change a few things. And, you know, we, uh, it, it made us a tight band. The live album was Hitting the Road Live, which had uh, Hitman Blues on it and uh, a couple of other new songs with green grass and all the hits in a live format so let me tell you the story about that first we spend thirty thousand dollars and we get peter frampton's truck the recorded frampton comes alive to come to dallas texas to play to record this big show we did every year dallas alley where it's a big street party for people far as you can see we had the worst night we ever had and i won't say why but we knew better okay <laughs> The next day we have to listen to it in its entirety well, with the suits. You're talking about <laughs> a long hour. It sounded horrible. We were a great band and monitors were just, everything could go wrong. We sounded like a sack of cats going down the river. I mean, it was awful. It was heart sinking. So um, as fate allows it, we um, somebody came up with this great idea in Rochester, New York. There was a place called Dejalon Studio at the time was real top of the, cutting the, uh, top of the craft or whatever. They uh, gave 50 people tickets on the radio, and they set 50 chairs out in the studio about the size of Capricorn. And we played a live show, live on the radio, and boom, we got a, a live record because it was a studio. So we were plugged into the studio, and so we come out smelling like a rose on that. We got really lucky, and uh, we used most of that live record is from that gig in Dejalon Studio. And um, there is a couple of other tracks that we used from Texas, but they were worked on heavily. And... Uh, so uh, about a year later, I was saying we do we do a full new outlaw record, first new outlaw record, and I forget how many years then, but quite a while. And Huey had this song Diablo Canyon. He'd been throwing around for a year or so, and we'd actually put the intro to that on Green Grass and High Tides. So if you notice on the live album, the intro to Green Grass is also the intro to Diablo. We whoops, you know, but, um, but the long in Indian sounding intro. But yeah, we um, we tossed around songs for. Uh, like I say, a year or so, and I thought some of Huey's best songs actually were not taken for the record. Um, I thought the strongest, three of the four of the strongest ones ended up being on his solo record later. Um, but great songs, and, and, and we, there were some good songs on, on the Diablo Canyon record. The Wheel, an old Loose Change song of mine, was kind of retooled, and we played that live a lot. 
And uh, we uh, we recorded it in Macon at Capricorn, and then Huey and I, our road manager, went out to San Rafael for two weeks to mix it. And these guys were these were hard rock guys, the engineers and producers that came to Macon to record us. And they wouldn't let us do it on our own. They're scared of something. Anyhow, they wouldn't let us in the studio for three days. We're out there, nothing to do. He goes, there's a method to my madness. Steve, I'm not talking bad about you, telling the truth. So um, we get in the third day, and it sounds awful. It's compressed, and it's just squashed down. And uh, Huey goes, you don't have any of those roughs from Macon? I said, yes, I do. Because I just happen to have one. Boop, we pop it in, and I'll give the guy credit. He immediately said, you know what? I know what I'm wrong. This is a different approach. This is an ensemble approach. So we basically started over <laughs> and uh, tried to get back to the making mix. And then we finished a couple of those songs, uh, New new Frontier. You and I have kind of finished the vocals there and did a swap off thing on it and everything. But most everything was already recorded. Greg Allman was supposed to play organ on there. We've been playing with him a lot lately. He lived right down the road, but uh, he never showed up. <laughs> he never showed up. He left a number for me. It was his accountant's number. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, whatever. Anyhow, I thought it counts. Uh, but Diablo Canyon, yes, we went out and toured for that, playing a lot of those new songs for a good year after that. Well, um, first thing I have to say is Billy Jones, the other guitar player in the original Outlaws. Great player, man. Les Paul, big tone, sweetheart of a guy. And uh, when I first joined the band, he would be hanging around Hughes house sometimes, and he gave him a tape back then, you know, some stuff he'd cut. And I, I remember asking Huey, man, why, why don't you get Billy back in the band? You know, it seems like he wants to play. And uh, the more I got to know Billy a little bit better, he, he was kind of in a fragile mental state. And I think that Huey was doing it to, to be a friend, to be honest with you. He didn't need to be out on the road. He went out with the Dixie All-Stars and, and uh, you know, it wasn't good. You know, he, he, uh, he had, Billy had a lot of mental problems by that time. Got somewhat schizophrenic, but just a, a nice guy and a great player, man. And. Uh, you know, definitely a, a good 50% of the guitar work in, in the original band. I mean, Huey played great together. Very different styles that worked really good together. You got Huey on the Fender, and you got Billy on the Gibson. And it was just great, man, it really was. And uh, another thing about those guys, they're singing, you know, they had a blend similar to the Eagles, I guess you could say. Uh, and part of that was Billy's high part on the top. And uh, when the Outlaws reformed, we went to Henry's house to, to rehearse and Randy the bass player that they have now sounds just like Billy Jones singing just naturally I guess so when Huey and Henry and him sang you know that, that was the sound of the band right there it really was and uh, I say you guys don't need me you know <laughs> and, and uh, the fourth part but it did it sounded really good and uh, like kind of like the original group you know a certain blend that voices have and Billy has a ha, 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 a lot of vibrato and a high real sweet sounding voice Freddie Salem was a great guitar player in the Outlaws. I got to know him a few times. He uh, had a restaurant in Ohio. When we were close by, we'd always go see him. And he got set up in jam with us a few times. And uh, a real uh, funny guy, you know, a real funny guy. Freddie is a, a real class act, too. A real nice fellow. I was never in the band with Monty. I sure wasn't. Um, uh, when I was in the band, B.B. Borden was playing with him the whole time. But Monty came back, you know, when they, when they reformed. And we played, I played Green Rest with him quite a few times on the volunteer jam and all that. So they, I got to play with Monty and David. You know, they had the double drummers when they came back. And, uh, yeah, both of those guys are great. And Monty's my buddy. He's a good-looking man, too. Monty, I hope he is. He's handsome. Yep, Henry Paul. Uh, uh, there was something about the way Henry Paul and Huey Thomason sang together. It's kind of like Don Hilly and Glenn Fry singing together. It makes two parts, makes something bigger than two parts. And um, and those guys had it, they really did. With Billy on the top, that was the blend of the Outlaws. And I think Henry brought in a little more uh, Stone Cold Country side of it, where Huey had his Western flair, you know, electric stuff. And Huey was, I mean, Henry was more the uh, acoustic country kind of guy. And that uh, was a real good blend, it really was. And uh, Henry has the Outlaws out now. And they sound great. They really do. I mean, they sound, uh, I don't want to say surprisingly well. It's not surprising they sound good, but they really do. They, they put together the band well, and they got good players, and, and they, they, they're doing it right. They sure are. You know, playing with the Outlaws and playing with Marshall Tucker is kind of like being in a cowboy movie. So in a lot of ways, it's a lot of similarities. Uh, I, I think my memoirs are going to be called Marshall Law. But, but yes, yeah, a lot of similarities, and uh, they share a lot of audiences. Although, as we were talking earlier, there's some outlaw fans that are real uh, particular about their outlaws. And there's Henry fans versus Huey fans of, of who this is and all. And then there's people that don't care about that, just like the music. 
and uh, but they have some some very loyal diehard fans, especially around Ohio and the Northeast and stuff. People that love their music and uh, they have their own brand of fans. Now there there's some people, be Marshall Tucker fans and Outlaw fans, but there's some of them. No, you know, Outlaws is their band and they're kind of kind of that way with it. But I think all Southern bands shared an initial audience anyway, and and probably a large part of them because they play with each other all the time. And uh, the Marshall Tucker band was very helpful to the Outlaws in their early days, and and they never forgot it because when somebody does something like that for you, it it uh, it means the world. Plus, it kind of helps you make it along your own way. And I think the same thing the brothers did for for uh, Tucker, they tried to extend to their guys, and probably they noticed that that. Western thing too, you know. Those, those, both of those bands have cowboy sounds in the songs a lot. You know, a lot of the words are about cowboy times, and uh, it's funny, you know, with both of those bands, the cowboy hats and all kind of came a little later. Really, the music had that Western feel to it, I think, from day one. But as Doug will say, the story the truck stops, the next thing you know, everybody's dressed up like cowboys. But you know, it's show business. But it's it's funny. Well, one chased the other. They were kind of sounding like Western, but then they dressed a little more Western, but. So um, as far as what I did with each band, um, it was similar. I'm a hired gun, I guess you could say, um, but it was a little different when, when I played with the Outlaws. Uh, any part that was Billy Jones would be my part, you know, and, uh, and uh, Huey, of course, would, would play his parts. And uh, now with Tucker, with, uh, you know, Toy played most all of the leads. So Rick and I switch off on it, on that. We kind of uh, play it more. With Marshall Tucker these days, we, we try to sometimes get the same type of sound, but doing it completely different. It's funny. We don't play the same licks or anything, but we try to keep the the feel of the songs in there somewhat, you know, authentic. And uh, and uh, the Marshall Tucker's a little more of a jamming band than the Outlaws. Now they jam too, but their songs are a lot more structured and and a lot louder and tighter, like a rock and roll band. Where Tucker is more the ensemble, kind of like the Brothers, so jam and everybody take a ride. And uh, but it's very similar and very different at the same time. You know, it was a real honor to play with the Outlaws and the Marshall Tucker Band. One thing I wish I would have done differently is get them to change the name to Chris Hicks and the Outlaws, or Chris Hicks and the Marshall Tucker Band, but nobody listens to me. So uh, anyhow, uh, it, it, what an honor to play with both of those bands. I don't think that I ever foresaw myself playing with either one of them. I thought they were great bands. Um, I thought it was kind of funny when I joined the Outlaws. I didn't, you know, uh, needed a job. It was a steady job in rock and roll, so I, I knew it would be good, but uh, I never knew I was gonna assimilate myself into the band or what has next. I just knew I wanted to keep playing. <laughs> yeah, playing with those guys, uh, one thing that I've learned from it and, and be grateful forever is is uh, when you work with a band like that, you have to be tough. You have to know how to travel and you have to hang in there even when you're feeling bad, and that's what that's what makes a man out of you. And uh, both of those bands are still road hard, and, and God bless them for doing it. Thank you, fellas. Thanks for watching this episode of Southern Rock Insider. Please hit subscribe and click the notification bell so you won't miss a single episode. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please respond below or you can email us at southernrockinsider at gmail.com. This is your Southern Rock Insider, Chris Hicks, and thanks again for watching. The Southern Rock Insider.